it's not really working is, is the thing. I, I, mean, I, I, I just process the world through um, human interaction, which in this particular instance reveals itself through financial markets movements. And so I just sort of like it. Um, also, I'm committed to a couple of charitable uh, enterprises that basically need a lot of money. Right. So uh, that's a, it's a good reason to, to work to, so that it can be funneled not just to the Internal Revenue Service and the United States Treasury, which I am a very significant contributor to, but also to something that I think matters rather than just some, some rat hole of administrative waste. And so I, I don't really resent the fact I pay so many taxes. I, it's sort of a privilege in a certain sense, but I also want to be able to see results right. for, for the money that I'm giving away. You can have impact. Yeah, you know, and it's a very big impact once it doesn't go through a bureaucratic machine. How about when folks are saying, you know, they should have a 70% marginal tax rate on, on the wealthiest? Well, my, when... my marginal tax rate is presently combined California and U.S. 52.6%. Mm -hmm. I... I I, I, I'm deeply offended when people tell me, no, it's not. I actually have had people say that to me. No, it's not. Rich people like you only pay 15%. I'm, I'm telling you, it's 52.6, all right? So that's because California is 13.3, and then there's federal, and there's, there's other things. So if they raise it to 70%, that'd be a 33% increase. I, I would go to 85.6%. I really think I would stop working. Yeah, who would, who would even work at that point? I, think, I really think I would stop working at 85.6. Um, so... The tax policy is pretty strange because a lot of people that are in my financial position really do pay low taxes. I remember Mitt Romney, I think, he had a 14% tax rate on some tax return that he revealed as part of his run for president. I mean, 14, it's just amazingly low. I, I agree, that that's ridiculous. But instead of raising me from 52.6 to 85.6, I think the 14ers should come up to 52.6. That's what should be happening. But um, I guess I'm just kind of in a very, very small minority. And so the others protect the 14 potential. Mm -hmm. So uh, tax policy is really weird. It's really weird to me that people making exactly the same amount of money pay very, very different tax rates. Well, you know, I know one of the areas that you're really focused on when it comes to philanthropy is art mm -hmm. and that you are a passionate art collector. How do you think art influences your career, your investment career? I don't really think it does. I, I, I think it's um, just very different. I mean, art is, um, you know, it's, it's very subjective. So I think it's a balance more than a, a tie-in to what I do. What I do, r running money, other people's money, is amazingly, at the end of the day, non-objective as to whether you've done a good job or not. It's actually painfully objective because it's a number to two decimal points or more. And it's your number versus that market number versus some other investor's number. And there's kind of no getting away from that. It's, the, it's incredibly easy to judge. Whereas art is incredibly subjective and you can't put any kind of definitive number on it. And so I, I kind of think it's a yin, yin and yang thing. One thing I do like is when you get off the elevator, you see double line, you see the, the painting that uh... You actually yeah, I did. did. I Tell through. us a story. What, is, what does the name Double Line mean? Well, it's interesting. I, for some unknown reason, in about 2005, woke up in the middle of the night, which I almost never do. I'm not one of these can't-sleep-at-night people. Um, I often get asked what keeps you up at night, and I say nothing. I mean, nothing. <laughs> nothing keeps you up at night. Well. <laughs> yeah. So I woke up in the middle of the night. For some unknown reason, I was obsessed with this idea, which I never even thought about before. If I start a money management firm, what would I call it? And I was like, it was just kind of a fun thought experiment. And so many names are meaningless. They're named after an intersection in a city or a Greek god or some sort of gibberish, you know, like, like first financial. Or if there is one, I'm not trying to insult them. But, it's, you know, names that don't really mean anything. Or rivers or something like this, lakes, geographic places. I was like, I'd want a name that kind of meant something. And so what would be a good name? And I had just bought my first Mondrian. Um, and it's his last great classical painting where two devices are used. One it was an early device called a progression, which is basically rectangles that progress. Another was a, a device he came up with in 1931, which is called the double line. And the double line is a further ambiguity between line and plane. 
because there are two lines that are close enough together that they look like two lines, but they could also be interpreted as kind of defining the negative space of a rectangle by bordering them. So I had this painting, picture, and it's got this, um, the double line. And I was thinking, you know, this double line, you know, that'd be a really good logo. And then I realized that it had a meaning, that the meaning was in the, everyone's life that they experience more frequently than they, like people go, double line, I, 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 what do you, there's a double line in the middle of a highway. Right. And it's by law, you're not supposed to cross it, but it's really there for your protection. At least you, you like to think it's there for a reason. And the reason, of course, is it's not safe. And so um, I realized, hey, that's pretty neat because I'm really risk averse. I think more about what you shouldn't do than what you should do. And what you shouldn't do is take fatal risks. That's what kills particularly fixed income investors. If you buy a lot of junky bonds and they default, your money's gone forever. If you buy a bunch of mortgages and they refinance at the wrong time, you've kind of lost money forever. But um, so it's what you, what you don't do. And I, and I thought that's perfect because it defines things that we won't take certain fatal risks. I was giving a speech years ago now, it was way back in our second year of business or something. I was giving a speech, two speeches in one day. One was in Bakersfield and one was in San Luis Obispo. And in Bakersfield, it's really interesting. It's a very wealthy community. You wouldn't think so, but it is. A lot of farmers and there's a lot of oil there. And I went to, gave the speech and a lot of guys showed up in overalls. They were farmers. There was a guy that was like the number two potash guy in the world or something. These billionaires and they're showing up in overalls. And they said, hey, you know, there's, I'm looking at my map. I've got to go to San Luis Obispo. There's two roads and I can't really tell which is the more efficient route. And the guy says, whatever you do, don't take this one. I go, why not? He said, it's called Blood Alley. I said, really? He goes, yep, there's more fatal head-ons on that road than any other one in the state. And the reason is that it's tractor country and it's very uh, windy and it's one lane each way, and tractors go slow, and people are impatient. And they just decide they're going to go for it, and their trucks come the other way, and they get wiped out. And that's why it's called Blood Ellie. And I said, that, I said, that's fantastic. That's exactly, and I started talking about the name of the firm and everything. And it was, it was pretty interesting. And, it's, and so we took the other road, obviously. It was pretty, pretty cool. We went over the San Andreas Fault, where the road has a massive sort of whoop-de-doo in it. It's really surprising. And I was like, what was, because I, I was like, what was that? And so someone said, that was a San Andreas fault. That's right halfway between those two. So anyway, that's kind of, the, the double line had uh, it really came to life with that, that guy in the overalls. Well, before I let you go, um, we've seen you on Twitter in the last, I don't know, when did you join? It was, it was, it was an Iris Sohn in Iris 2017. Sohn, that's right. That's right. Yeah. So what's your take on social media now that you have somewhat of a presence? I have no presence. I, don't, I follow nobody. But you I, tweet a lot and you get a lot of retweets. Well, I don't tweet that much, but I do sometimes. I'm just trying to give people an uh, insight into what I'm really thinking. I get a lot of, um, there's a lot of misreporting that goes on in financial media. Um, there's a lot of people that report on what somebody reported on, that somebody reported on, and like that old telephone game that you do in first grade where you go through the class right. and it ends up starting to be, you know, the sun is shining and the last person says the cow is in the hotel and you can't figure out how the message got so altered. But that happens with re-reporting. And I like to tell people what I really think. So I, I like interviews that are live or ones that um, I do a written statement because I find, when I do webcasts, for example, the stuff that gets reported, more than half of it's wrong. I mean, no, I didn't say that. They'll like, they'll like leave out the word not <laughs> mm -hmm. and, and invert the meaning. So I like to have the Twitter account where if something like that goes off, I can say, you know, this is actually what I'm, this is truly where I'm coming from. But we'll never see Jeffrey Gunlock on Facebook? Never. Never. Never on Facebook. I don't know what Instagram is. I've never downloaded an app in my life. Do you still have an opinion on Facebook? I do remember you spoke about it. It was a pair trade at some yeah, maybe last yeah, year. Yeah, and, and you know, it, it fell a lot. It's rebounded back up. I, I just think that Facebook, their big problem is obviously their business model. And I talked about things that are safe that end up being unsafe. I, I think that's Facebook. I mean, they sell themselves as comfortable and safe, but they're really just a diabolical data collection monster. And they don't, they, they're unrepentant. And I just saw yesterday, they're talking about more regulation in, in Europe, in the UK. And when the regulars show up, usually the stock prices go down. Like healthcare had a meteoric rise until the regulators showed up a few years ago, and then a big decline. 
So I, I'm not, I, I don't really trust Facebook. Um, so the fact that I don't trust them makes me not like them. And the fact that I don't like them makes me want their stock to go down. There you go. We're really railing against how much money we spend on old people in the United States government system as opposed to how much we spend on young people. Mm -hmm. And in that article, the ratio was seven to one, how much we of the budget goes to, to paying for things for people over 65 compared to paying for things for people under 21. I can't remember if it's 21 or 25, whatever, but young people. And if you're investing in dying people and not investing in the future, you don't have a very bright future. And so it's, millennials are starting to understand that the baby boomers have all the wealth mm -hmm. and millennials don't really, I mean, they can't afford a house, you know, they've got student loan debt. Right. And they're starting, to, they're starting to believe, I think, finally, that they kind of got screwed by the uh, system. People want to see the idea that they have get ratified or corroborated by a crawler on some financial program. And they, oh, I see, now it's safe to do this because everybody else saying that this is the conclusion you're supposed to draw. But by then it's priced in. So the opportunities, by the time it's safe and you have a confirmation that your idea might be broadly embraced, by, by then it's too late. So that's really the key. Um, also, just trying to find relationships. I have a whole team that what we do is we just look for correlations that might be common sense, but then you, you verify them. Some things that just correlate well. Like, like for example, things like um, the Fed's underlying inflation gauge, which doesn't get nearly enough attention. It correlates incredibly well to CPI, core CPI, on about an 18-month lead basis. It's got about an 80% correlation. Nobody knows about this. Well, we, we do. Um, unfortunately, I, I speak to people like you and I give my ideas away. But it's okay because relationships don't hold up forever. You've got to, the world changes, the variables change, the coefficients change that drive um, things. And so it's really important that you sort of just stay on top of it. That's, that's why I do what I do. I mean, I could have retired a long time ago. I, um, I find it very interesting as a way of processing human behavior, society, and just um, understanding what makes the world go around. Well, I want to follow up on a couple of things here. Um, you mentioned that your team here, and I've, I've met a few folks from Double Line in the past couple of years. How do you think about talent? What do you look for when you're hiring someone? Um, I generally like to hire people who either I know or who know nothing. I don't like bringing in people from other firms who have like eight years experience because they've learned some other way. And it does, not that the other way is wrong, but it's not the way we do things. And it's not that we do everything perfectly. There's only our way. But I like people who are right out of school because that way they don't have to be un, you know, untrained from what they thought they learned somewhere else. And then I like people that I know the way they think. So we like people that are very analytic. We like people who are, um, believe in shared success. I tell people when they start working here, at many firms, you succeed by killing the person next to you. If you, even move, if you even go in that direction, you're gone. I want people to want the person next to them to do well. Because the person next to you doing well means the firm does well. And so we have a, a shared success philosophy. And it kind of comes from the top because I never yell at anybody. Uh, my, my philosophy is everything that goes right, the team, the team did it, and everything goes wrong, it's my fault. And I think that people appreciate that.